friends, I'm very uh, happy to be with you today uh, because uh, this is the capital of Fortress Europe where we are situated in. And uh, this is where a lot of dirty business is going on and where unaccompanied children are being kept in uh, little prisons built for so-called terrorists. So it's extremely appropriate that this is uh, where we're meeting today. Uh, just a, a few brief points. I totally agree with what my colleagues uh, on this panel have said, so I'm not going to repeat it. I mean, as far as Britain is concerned, <clears throat> some of us on the left argued that Brexit would be a very good thing to punish both the British establishment and the European establishment, uh, which once again waged a campaign of fear to frighten people, uh, hoping that they would be scared off. But people finally took the risk, and not a majority of them, not for racist reasons, as John Rees pointed out, but to get some sovereignty. And the reason for demanding that sovereignty was because of what happened to Greece. What is the point, even if we managed to elect Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party and he won an election, what's the bloody point if the EU then vetoes every single program, programmatic demand in Corbyn's manifesto? What are we going to do? So that played a part, subconsciously and sometimes consciously, that the uh, demands of uh, uh, being put by the Labour left in their manifesto, which are a bit more radical than the Thessaloniki program you had, uh, would be impossible to implement. That was clear. So I think all this played a part, and people finally said we are going to take a risk we're going to pull out. And the establishment is still in a deep state of shock. Some of them admiring Tsipras in retrospect for ignoring his own referendum and thinking maybe we can do the same too. But they can't do the same because the political costs of doing the same would outweigh the economic costs. And they're not going to be able to do it. But the main argument the two things will happen. The main argument used by the financial press, the Financial Times, the Economist, and the liberal press particularly, was that the EU was a model. There were no criticisms of the EU. And for young people in Britain, many young people, they have this idealized notion of the EU uh, uh, as something which is very wonderful without knowing anything that happens in the EU at all. That's the tragedy. And I remember, you know, it really reminded me some of this emotional outpouring in London, in particular in the Southeast, but particularly in London, by young people of when Princess Diana died and the whole country suddenly became monarchist. And some people were arguing, but uh, the, uh, Diana's death is going to end the monarchy because it's going to make the Queen very unpopular and people were gathering in Hyde Park to sing God Save the Queen, which didn't make the Queen feel very unpopular, by the way. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, <clears throat> it reminds me of that thoughtless, empathy, emotional, without any serious attention being paid to this, largely because there hasn't, because the campaign was so bad, the official campaign. There was no one from the left in a position to explain what the EU was, and just let's look at it on every single front. I don't have time to go through every European country. It's a mess. In Italy, last week, the EU agreed that the Italian banks were in a complete crisis and they could go down very quickly. So, uh, are they going to be bailed out by the ECB or by who? Are they allowed to go down? What is going to happen? On that, there's silence. In France, you see a massive uprising of trade unionists, of workers, and of students against a government which is trying to impose laws to restrict workers' rights fully backed by the European Union. Fully backed by the European Union. And this is, uh, uh, it's having a positive effect in the following way. 
that it may shock some of you to know this, but the opinion polls taken over the last five or six years in France have shown, unfortunately, that a majority of young people supported Le Pen. Why? Because they were fed up with their own establishments for doing nothing. That's why they turn in a volatile way. This campaign in France is pulling them back away from that particular solution. So the uh, politics, radical politics, does help a great deal in pulling people away from reactionary solutions which appear temporarily convincing. And by the way, for people who don't know the, the French socialist prime minister, I mean, the language he has used is the same as Nigel Farage in Britain. I mean, there's a, there's a, doc, uh, a, a, a film in which he didn't know he was being recorded. Someone was filming him walking through the French city of Evry and saying to another friend of his on the streets, pas blanc, he couldn't see any white faces on the street. And it worried him. Uh, actually, even Farage hasn't said that, to be fair. Not that I want to be fair to this creep. But <coughs> that's just the situation. The attacks made on the Romani people, on the traveling people in France, by Val, soon after he came in, showed how they were trying to win back right-wing votes by going and fighting the battle on the ground agreed by the right wing. And that is what the center-left parties in Europe have tended to do. And that is why, I mean, if you look in, <clears throat> in Germany today, the uh, rise of this extreme right party consisting of members from both the CDU and the SPD, how many did they get? 14% in the last elections. In Germany, which is the dominant power inside the EU, and which dominates the EU. State-to-state -state relations are useless because the Germans are so dominant economically, politically. Uh, if you look at Spain, we haven't had a victory there in the last elections. Why? People are frightened. There is real fear because people don't see another alternative. And one reason they don't see another alternative is because social democracy in its pure form or even in its impure form, is prohibited. You can't do it. This was the dominant discourse of the EU and the international capitalist class and rulers that finance capital and politics, there was a complete symbiosis together. No need for any politics outside this. So the differences between center left and center right virtually disappeared, virtually, not completely, but virtually disappeared, and you saw it in Greece, of course, in the most dramatic way with the collapse of Pasauk. And then we've seen it again here <coughs> with what Tsipras is doing, effectively making uh, 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 Greece into a state which does the dirty work of the EU. Send your refugees here, we'll send them to Turkey from here. And not just on refugees, I mean the position taken by the Greek government, for instance, on Israel, is politically more reactionary than even the United States. For Cyprus to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel is shocking. Even the Americans haven't done that. That is the degree and the extent to which he has fallen on his knees and capitulated to every possible establishment he can capitulate to. Find him another establishment and he'll capitulate to that as well. <laughs> so if you look at the three big countries of the EU, Germany, Italy, and France, uh, they're in crisis, Germans less so, the Italians very much so, and the French equally. If you look at the youth unemployment figures in all the EU countries, they're pretty high. They vary. 50% in Spain, 40% in Italy, 30% in France, going up and down, up and down. So the notion that somehow the EU is in a perfect condition is nonsensical. 
It needs a change. It needs a change from below. And the left needs to have a European alternative. Those of us who voted and fought for Lexit, a left exit from uh, the EU in Britain, argued always we will work with all our European comrades and colleagues and friends and like-minded people to prepare a proper alternative. Otherwise, it, it's, it's uh, not going to happen. And you know, Britain is at the moment, as John said, in a very deep political crisis, a full-blown political crisis, not just an economic crisis. So that what's happening in the conservative and labor parties is a bad imitation of Shakespeare. People killing each other, stabbing each other in the front, in the back, wherever they can. Uh, to try and get rid of leaders they don't like, in the case of the Tories, and Labour, where the old Blairite tradition is now under challenge, and they are fighting like crazy to try and stop that challenge from succeeding, with the most disgusting things being done and said. Uh, and they will pay a price for it. They will pay a price uh, on, 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 on many levels. So. I think what we have to do, of course, on refugees, there's no question what we have to do. We have to fight as, as, as best we can. But we can't totally dodge the question or avoid it or think it will go away by ignoring what has caused this latest outbreak, if you like, of people fleeing their countries. No one likes leaving their country. The Germans and Italians who fled to the United States in the middle of the 19th century didn't want to go. They had to go. The Irish didn't want to go. They had to go because of huge famines, huge economic crisis, lack of jobs. And some people from Greece who went to Australia did so for the same reasons. Migration, the world has been built on migration, the entire world movement of populations, and sometimes movements due to wars. I mean, the refugees before and after the Second World War, we know about. Jews fleeing Germany, communists fleeing Germany. After the war, citizens of German origin being kicked out of the territories where, uh, which were German and being sent back. All this has been happening. So why is today different? It's a continuum. People are getting worked up about it in some cases precisely because they feel there is nothing to look forward to in their own everyday life and in their own political involvement with the system that exists today. That is why they are getting completely worked up about it and that is why Fortress Europe uh, is, you know, being made more and more solid by the European Union. <laughs> and the wars that they have waged, who asked them to wage these wars? I mean, Bush did, but they didn't have to follow him, but they did. Because the United States is in such a dominant power as an imperial power that they don't want to offend it, though it has to be said that the Germans and French refused to wage war on Iraq. They said no. <laughs> Barroso, this idiot from Portugal who once used to be a Maoist <coughs> and was caught stealing furniture from the university for his Maoist headquarters. <laughs> uh, this idiot who was uh, uh, president of uh, Portugal and backed the war, then he became president of the EU and now he's just joined Goldman Sachs. So it's a nice evolution from Maoism to Goldman Sachs by the European <laughs> Union. <clears throat> and if you look at these people, that is what they are like. Interested largely in money. And politics for many of these politicians all over the European Union has become a way of making money. And the Panama Papers have not all been published. Politicians from every single EU country are involved in that. And Juncker. This guy from Luxembourg, which in itself is a tax haven. Just think about it. Luxembourg is a tax haven. Juncker runs it, 
carried out criminal acts. And he is now, the Germans made him the boss of Europe. Of course, they run it from Berlin, but they need people like that, you know? Uh, butlers and servants and people like Gisselflaum in Holland and uh, Juncker, and Juncker then patronizes people from the smaller southern European countries. He pats Cypras on his face, hello, you've been a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> and Cypras is pleased because he's now getting the approval of the European. But that's how they behave. And how they've behaved to Ireland, Portugal, and they are still now saying that the Irish have to privatize their water, despite the largest social movement that country has seen for 50 years. And they're telling the Portuguese, you have to impose austerity, otherwise we'll start fining you. So basically, there is no respect in the EU for democracy. They feel they can get away with it, and they can't because of the scale of the 2008 Wall Street crash. No one trusts them. And so they're not going to be able to get away with it, which is why the tectonic plates are shifting, which is why the British voted uh, Brexit, which is why Greece, Spain, Italy, Portugal are in a huge crisis in one way or the other. And it's not going to be sorted out quickly unless people see now a very clear alternative, especially in this country. You know, there was the experience of Pasok, then there was the experience of Syriza, a big, big tragedy, because the entire left in Europe had real hopes in Syriza, as much hopes as you did. And we were shocked and angry and felt defeated and depressed when the great capitulation took place. But these things happen. One has to recognize them for what they are and not try to cover them up or to prettify them and then move on. And that is what I think the Brexit will do. It will create a debate now in every single European country, small and big, to see how to move forward. And we have to be part of that debate and we have to build an alternative and we have to defend democracy and democratic rights in the sharpest way possible, because I'll tell you something. The elites who rule this continent don't care a damn now about democracy except in the most formal sense. They're not going to defend it. The task will fall to progressive people all over Europe actually to defend democratic rights, to defend accountability, and to implement democratic decisions when they are taken at the polls. Thanks.